I'm Father Joel, and welcome to Pilgrim Priest. I want to thank everyone who's been patient with this podcast and also with the Antigo Area Catholic Church's YouTube channel that's been having some sound issues. Hopefully, we got those ironed out for now, and you'll be able to listen without a problem. Thank you for your patience. God bless you. The Lord be with you. I love the way that when we, you know, do Catholic stuff, you sort of get in the habit. It sort of becomes a reflex. If I start, bless us, O Lord, you can't help yourself but say, and these thy gifts. Uh, But sometimes when it becomes a habit or a reflex, we don't make the time to truly reflect on what it is that we're doing or what it is that it means. What does it mean to say the Lord be with you? That's an English translation from the Latin. The Latin is Dominus Vobiscum. Some of our older, uh, excuse me, more senior members of our congregation know that the response to Dominus Vobiscum is et cum spiritu tuo, and with your spirit, leading one guy to tell me that God's number is spiritu tuo. Dominus Vobiscum doesn't have a verb. It literally just is the Lord with you. The verb is implied. Is it the Lord is with you or the Lord be with you? Probably yes. Dominus Vobiscum, the Lord with you. The Lord with you, it's a reminder to us that the Lord is with us, that he is Emmanuel, God with us. I believe that when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, when Jesus was incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary and born as a man, that the 33 years of Jesus' life on earth was not the only time that God was with us, but rather it was meant to be a visible sign of the invisible reality that God is with us that he is God with us. It's easy to forget that God is with us. It's easy to to think that he's a million billion years away, that God is floating on a cloud somewhere, perfectly happy. And he's, at some point, he's like, how many kids do I have? Well, you got like seven billion. What? What have they been up to? I just created two of them, and then I said, get busy. Oh, my God. I don't know what God says. Oh, my me. We sort of think that God's some kind of deadbeat dad. He had a bunch of kids he doesn't know about. But our Christian message constantly reminds us that the Lord isn't as far away as we think, that he is God with us. Again, we come to Mass on Sundays, and we know that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. We genuflect to Jesus in the tabernacle. But I think Catholics often think, well, hi, Jesus. Okay, Jesus, bye, see you next week, as if we're not going to see Jesus between now and next Sunday, because he's in church. And sometimes we like the fact that he keeps his distance, that I can do what I want at home and at work and with my friends. How would my life look different if I remembered that the Lord is with us? When we pray, we often make the sign of the cross, we talk, we wait for God to say something, God doesn't seem in the mood to say much, so we do more talking, we spend a half an hour talking to God, we don't really wonder, we wonder why he's not responding, and then we're done talking, or we're done talking, and we leave our prayer, and we think that God's done talking, as though God's not going to communicate with me the rest of the day. So I'm not listening, I'm not looking, I don't remember that the Lord is with me. It's a great exercise before you go to bed at night to spend a few minutes in prayer and to ask, God, where were you today? Where were you in my day? And you'd be be surprised if you start that practice how many different ways that you will begin to notice that the Lord is with you. You know, there are times in my life where I felt very much alone, where I felt like no one was there for me, And I wondered where was God. When I did my 30-day silent retreat the summer before I was ordained a deacon, one of the first things the Lord wanted to impress upon me was that He was with me. And He had always been with me. 
And even though there were, in fact, times when I felt alone, I was never alone. And I began to trust that more deeply. I began to trust that the Lord was with me. Every time I was facing difficulties and I would go and pray about the difficulties, the Lord wouldn't give me the answers to all my questions. He would just remind me, I'm with you. You don't have to do it alone. That was often enough to take the pressure off, to realize that I didn't have to figure it out myself, but that the Lord was with me. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And that means that Jesus is here. Two or three gathered in Jesus' name, doesn't that describe the church? How many of us came here expecting to meet Jesus, to to hear him speak to us, that he would be present to us? Where two or three are gathered in my name, doesn't that describe a family? Isn't your family a place where two or three gather in the name of Jesus? That means that Jesus is in the midst of your family. Doesn't that describe a small group, a Bible study, a prayer group? That Jesus is with you when you gather with fellow Christians to pray together. The Lord is with us. We have all these reminders of his presence because we need them, because it's easy to forget. If I can't see it in front of me, out of sight, out of mind. But it's in this context of the Lord's presence that I want you to understand today's readings. The the Lord is with us. It's his loving presence that we are responding to. So the first challenge for every Christian is to remain in his love. Just as Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I also love you. Remain in my love. When I did the John Paul II healing prayer thing, they spent the first third of the prayer training teaching us as people praying with others to remain in God's love. And then from that place of love to reach out in love to others. So that's what I see as our, our, our challenge oftentimes. We're trying to love others, but I don't feel loved. I don't think that I'm loved. I'm not sure that God is with me. I feel like a failure. I'm not all that good. How can other people possibly love me? Well, from that place of doubting my value, it's really hard to genuinely love the people around me. I tend to end up using them. I end up being afraid that they won't love me or accept me, or I end up using them to make me feel better about myself. It's only when I move into that place of love, when I ar- allow the Lord to truly love me, that I can love my spouse, my family, my co-workers, my neighbors, and those annoying people in my life freely and generously because I know that I am loved. It doesn't matter how they treat me. I don't need anything from them because I'm already loved. I don't have to worry about them rejecting me because I know that I am loved by God. So I think remaining in God's love is a really important thing for all of us. We receive communion. Jesus will enter not just your heart, but your stomach. But he's not going to leave in 10 minutes. He wants to remain with you the rest of the day, the rest of the week. And the challenge for us is to remain with him. To remind ourselves in big ways and little ways, in every day and, and every hour, and even every minute that the Lord is with me. That I'm not doing this alone. So, sometimes the Lord might invite me to say something to a coworker or a brother. I guess in the first reading, I think it, it, it doesn't obligate all of us to speak up when we see people doing bad things. I think that you notice the context. First of all, Ezekiel has been appointed as a watchman for the house of Israel. His job is to stand on the wall, spiritually speaking, and to look for danger and to warn the people down below that danger is coming. And so then he, as a prophet, receives from the Lord and then shares what he hears. In other words, he's in connection with God, and it's from that place that he then speaks, hey, you need to be careful. And you'll notice that he's speaking because the Lord wants to have mercy. The Lord is judging the situation as bad, but he's actually inviting the wicked person to repentance, to change, to mercy, to forgiveness. These two things go hand in hand in Jesus Christ, his judgment and his mercy. 
And we're invited to love in the same way. And I think it's hard for us to put judgment and mercy together. Sometimes we land on the side of mercy. Oh, it's okay. God loves you. Do whatever you want. You be you. You know, I don't want any conflict, so I'm not going to speak up. So we're, we're so merciful that we don't speak the truth to people and don't end up truly loving them. But then on the other hand, sometimes we can be judgmental. We can say, that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. You need to do this. You need to not do that. And we land on the side of judgment, but without really having mercy. And what we notice is that God is doing both at the same time. He is judging this as wicked, but he's inviting the wicked person to repentance, to mercy. And so we must do the same. We must, we can't let evil go. We can't not speak up. But when we do, it has to be out of a place of mercy, out of a place of love for that person and inviting that person to new life, to true life, to give up the habits and patterns that aren't good for this person or for the people around them. Judgment and mercy go hand in hand in Jesus, and they're invited to go hand in hand in us. That's not easy for any of us. Some of us will err on the side of judgment. We need to work hard to be more merciful. Some of us will err on the side of mercy, and we need to work hard to be a little more honest about the evil that we see around us. But all of us are challenged to be like Jesus, and none of us will do it like Jesus. Fortunately, the Lord is with us. So this brings us to our gospel reading. If my brother sins against me, what I should do is I should complain to everyone else about how what a rotten jerk my brother is. No, because that's not a loving way to respond to evil. If my brother sins against me, I need to go back to him and I need to say, hey, brother, when you said this, it really hurt my feelings. When you did this, it was really hurtful. And if my brother says, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you received it that way, or I I didn't mean it the way you, you heard it, but I could see how you could interpret it that way. Well, then we can reconcile, and I've won over my brother. If instead my brother says, oh, yeah, you're the problem, and here's why. Well, then I need to step back and I need to get a second opinion. I need to involve a couple other people. First of all, because where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them, so I'm opening them up to God's judgment and mercy. But second of all, it's hard for me to be objective in a situation that involves me. I have a certain bias. So I need to get a second opinion so that I realize, well, maybe it's really me. Maybe I'm being oversensitive. Maybe I'm blowing this out of proportion. Maybe I have a problem here that I need to work on, and it's easy for me to blame my brother instead of facing my own difficulties. So by including some other people, I can get a clearer picture. And if those other people are like, yeah, your brother really needs to change, then we go back again, and if he doesn't listen to them, speak to the church. And if he doesn't speak to the listen to the church, then treat him as a Gentile or a tax collector. That sounds awfully extreme, right? It sounds like you're nothing to me, brother. But wait, how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Did he reject them? Did he treat them as beneath his dignity? No. Jesus loved Gentiles and tax collectors, and Jesus was always inviting them with mercy out of their sinful ways and into uh, true life. And so what Jesus is saying is not, cast him off, you're dead to me, brother, but saying, I need some distance. If you're going to keep hurting me and you're not going, we can't reconcile as long as you're going to keep up the hurtful work. I need some distance from you. I'm going to love you from a distance. The door is open, the invitation is there. If you choose to move, mercy is waiting for you. But I'm not going to move out of my place of abiding with the Lord. I'm not going to allow your negativity to cling to me. I'm not going to fight evil with evil. I'm going to keep loving you. But if you're not truly loving me, then we can't be in a relationship. And so the invitation is there, but there's distance until you choose to move into a truly loving place. This is what I think is going on in this dynamic, is that we are loved by God, we need to remain in his love, and from that place we need to love others. 
But not everything that people do is loving. And so when they don't, we need to judge that. We need to be honest about that. But we also need to offer mercy. We need to offer invitation. Judgment and mercy coming together. Again, as I said, only the Lord is, truly gets this right. It'll be a process for all of us. But fortunately, we don't have to do it alone because the Lord is with us. So little Johnny's mom goes to her husband and she says, Honey, uh, I think little Johnny's taking um, cash out of my purse every time I have cash in there. What do we do about it? And he says, Well, you could hide it in his school books. He'd never find it there. <laughs> no, actually, they confronted him. They didn't, uh, you know, do a passive-aggressive thing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not everything's a homily. However, beware, when you're around Father Joel, you might wind up in a homily. <laughs>